Chapter Thirty Eight of the Little Minister. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Little Minister by J. M. Barry. Chapter Thirty Eight. Thrums during the twenty-four hours. Defense of the manse. Hardly had I crossed the threshold of the mud house when such a sickness came over me that I could not have looked up, though Nanny's voice had suddenly changed to Margaret's. Vaguely I knew that Nanny had put the kettle on the fire, a woman's first thought when there is illness in the house, and as I sat with my hands over my face I heard the water dripping from my clothes to the floor. "'Why is that bell ringing?' I asked at last, ignoring all questions and speaking through my fingers. An artist, I suppose, could paint all expression out of a human face. The sickness was having that effect on my voice. "'It's the eye of Lick Bell,' Sanders said, "'and it's almost as fearsome to listen to as last Nick's rain. I wish I kent what they're ringing it for.' "'Wish no it's things,' said Nanny nervously. "'There's things it's best to put off kennin' as lang as we can.' "'It's that ill click at which have you McBean that makes Nanny speak so doleful,' Sanders told me. There was to be a prayer meeting last night, but Mr. Dishart never came to it, though they rang till they raxed their arms. And now, if he says, it'll ring on by itself till he's brocked Hama a corp. The helicat says the rain's a dispensation to drown him in for neglect of duty. Sal, I would think little of the Lord if he needed to create a new sea to drown one man in. <laughs> Nanny, you cutty, there's no swearing. I defy you to find a single lonely oath in what I've said. "'Never mind, Effie McBean,' I interposed. "'What are the congregation saying about the minister's absence?' "'We can little except what Effie told us,' Nanny answered. "'I was at Tilly Drum yestreen meeting Sanders as he got out of the goal, "'and that awful oanding began when we was on the belly's prize. "'We fucked our way through it, but not a soul did we meet, "'and wow would gang out the day that can buy that hama. "'Ay, but Effie says it's Kent in Thrums that Mr. Dishart has run off wi' wi' an Egyptian.' "'You're waur than her, Nanny,' Sanders said roughly, "'for you hae twa reasons for kennin' better. "'In the first place, has Mr. Dishart no keeped you in siller a' the time I was awa, "'and for another have I no been at the manse?' "'My head rose now.' "'He guide to the manse,' Nanny explained, "'to thank Mr. Dishart for being so good to me. "'Ay, but Jean wouldna let him in. "'I'm thinking that looks gay, gray. "'Whatever was her reason,' Sanders admitted, Jean wouldn't open a door, but I kicked in at the parlor window and saw Mrs. Dishart in looking very cosy and larkin. And do you think I would I seen that if ill had come o'er the minister? Not if Margaret knew of it, I said to myself, and wondered at Waman's forbearance. She had a skein of worsted stretched out on her hands, Sanders continued, and a young lady was winding it. I did not see her right, but she was not a Thrums lady. If you make beans, says she's his intended, come to call him to account, Nanny said. But I hardly listened, for I saw that I must hurry to Thomas Wamond's. Nanny followed me to the gate with her gown pulled over her head and said excitedly, Oh, Dominie, I warrant it's true. It'll be Bobby. Sanders doesn't suspect because I've told him nothing about her. Oh, what's to be done? They were be so good to me. I could only tell her to keep what she knew to herself. Has Rob Dow come back? I called out after I had started. "'Well, fry,' she replied, and then I remembered that all these things had happened while Nanny was at Tilly-drum. In this life some of the seven ages are spread over two decades, and others pass as quickly as a stage play. Though a fifth of a season's rain had fallen in a night and a day, it had scarcely kept pace with Gavin. I hurried to the town by the roods. That the Bry was deserted as the country roads except where children had escaped from their mothers to wade in it, here and there dams were keeping the water away from one door to send it with greater volume to another, and at points the ground had fallen in, but this I noticed without interest. I did not even realize that I was holding my head painfully to the side, where it had been blown by the wind and glued by the rain. I have never held my head straight since that journey. Only a few looms were going, their pedals in water. I was addressed from several doors and windows, once by Charles Yule. "'Dinna pretend,' he said, "'that you have walked in for the schoolhouse alone.' The rain chased me into this house yestreen, and here it has kept me, though I bide no further awa than Tillylosh. Charles, I said in a low voice, why is the old lick bell ringing? 
how you know her about mr dishart he asked oh man that's lang thomas in the kirk by himself tearing at the bell to bring the folk to get her to depose the minister instead of going to woman's house in the school wind i hastened down the banker's close to the kirk and had almost to turn back so choked was the close with floating refuse i could see the bell swaying but the kirk was locked and i battered on the door to no purpose then remembering that henry munn lived in coat's trance i set off for his house he saw me cross in the square but would not open his door until i was close to it when i open he cried squeeze through quick but though i did his bidding a rush of water darted in before me henry reclosed the door by flinging himself against it when i saw you cross in the square he said it was surprise enough to cure the hiccup henry i replied instantly why is the isle lick bell ringing he put his finger to his lip i see he said imperturbably you've met her folk in the glen and heard frae them about the minister what folk mair than half the congregation he replied i started for glen quaharty twa hours syne to help the farmers you didn't see them no they must have been on the other side of the river again that question forced my lips why is the bell ringing canny dominie he said till we're up the stair missy munker's lugs at her keyhole listening to you yo lie henry mun cried an invisible woman the voice became more plaintive i can a heap henry so you may as well tell me ah look away at the bone ye high the shoemaker replied heartlessly and conducted me to his room up one of the few inside stairs then in thrums Hendry's oddest furniture was five boxes, fixed to the weight at such a height that children could climb into them from a high stool, In these his baron slept, and so space was economized I could never laugh at the arrangement, as I knew that Betty had planned it on her deathbed for her man's sake. Five little heads bobbed up in their beds as I entered, but more vexing to me was weary world on a stool. In boy, Domini, he said sociably, Sal, you need to fear burning wet that water on you. You're in mere danger o' coming a boil i want to speak to you alone hendry i said bluntly you winna put me out hendry the alarmed policeman entreated mind you said in sich weather you would be friendly to a brute beast ay ay dominie what's your news it's welcome be it good or bad you would meet the townsfolk in the glen and they would tell you about mr dishart what you had heard oh sirs he's a lost man there would hae been a meeting the day to depose him if so many hadna gain to the glen but the morn'll do as weel the very woman is cursing him and the laddies has begun to gather stones he's married to an egypt henry i cried like one giving an order weary world step said henry sternly and then added soft-heartedly here's a bit of news that'll open missy munker's door to you you can tell her frae me that the bell's ringing just because i forgot to tie it up last night and the wind's shaking it and i win a gang out in the rain to stop it hi the policeman said looking at me sulkily she may open her door for that but it'll no let me in tell me mare tell me what the lady at the manse is out you go answered hendry once she opens the door you can shove your foot in and sign she's in your power he pushed world out and came back to me saying it was best to tell him the truth to keep him from making up lies but is it the truth i was told lang tammas ay i can that story but tammas has other work on hand then tie up the bell at once hendry i urged i canna he answered gravely tammas took the keys of the kirk from me yestreen and when i gave them up he says the bell is being rung by the hand of god has he been at the manse does mrs dishart know he's been at the manse twa or three times but jane barred him out she'll let nobody in till the minister comes back and so the mistress kens nothing but what's the use of keeping a fry her any langer never use i said none answered hendry sadly dominie the minister was married to the egyptian on the hill last night and thomas was witness not only were they married but they've run off all together you are wrong hendry i assured him telling him as much as i dared i left mr dishart in my house what but if that is so how did he no come back with you because he was nearly drowned in the flood she be with him he was alone hendry's face lit up dimly with joy and then he shook his head tammas was witness he said can you deny the marriage all i ask of you i answered guardedly is to suspend judgment until the minister returns there can be nothing done at any rate he said till the folk themselves come back friday glen and i need not tell you how glad we would a be to be as fond of him as ever but tammas was witness 
have pity on his mother man we've done the best for her we could he replied we prigged with thomas no to gang the manse till he was sure the minister was living for if he has been drowned we said his mother need never ken what we're thinking of doing i and we're sorry for the young lady too what young lady is this you all talk of i asked she's his intended ay you need a start she has come at a road frying glass cold to challenge him about the gypsy the pitiful thing is that mrs dishart lodged away her fears and now they're baith waiting for his return as happy as ignorance can make them there is no such lady i said but there is he answered doggedly for she came in a machine late last night and i was i know a dozen that baith heard and saw through my window it stopped at the manse near half an hour what's mare the lady herself was at samo for quarsons in the tenements the day for twa hours i listened in bewilderment and fear samuel's bairns down with scarlet fever and like to die and him being a widow man he is gone useless you maun blame the wives in the tenements for hodden back they're fleid to smite their ain little uns and as it happens samuel's friends is uh, off to the glen will he ran greeting to the manse for mr dishart and the lady heard him crying to jean to the door and what does she do but gang straight to the tenements with samuel her goodness has naturally put the folk on her side against the minister this does not prove her his intended i broke in she was heard saying to samuel answered the kirk officer that the minister being awa it was her duty to take his place yes and though she little kent it he was already married hendry i said rising i must see this lady at once is she still at farquharson's house she may be back again by this time tammas set off for samuel as soon as he heard she was there but he just missed her i left him there an hour sign he was waiting for her determined to tell her all i set off for the tenements at once declining hendry's company the wind had fallen so that the bell no longer rang but the rain was falling doggedly the streets were still deserted i pushed open the presenter's door in the school wind but there was no one in the house tibby burst saw me and shouted from her door ha you heard o mr dishart he'll never dar show his face and drums again without giving her a word i hastened to the tenements the lady's no here samuel farquharson told me and thomas is back in the manse again trying to force his way in from samuel too i turned with no more than a groan but he cried after me perdition on a man that has played that lady false had margaret been at her window she must have seen me so recklessly did i hurry up the minister's road with nothing in me but a passion to take woman by the throat he was not in the garden the kitchen door was open jean was standing at it with her apron to her eyes thomas Wamond, i demanded and my face completed the question you're o'er late she wailed you were oh dominie whar's the minister you base woman i cried why did you unbar the door it was the mistress she answered she heard him shaking it and i had to tell her why it was dominie it's all oh, my white he tried to get in last night and roared threats through the door and after he had gone awa she speared who i had been speaking to i had to tell her but i said he had come to let her ken that the minister was taking shelter friday rain in a farmhouse ay i said he was to bide there till the flood guide down and that's how she has been easy a day i acted for the best but i'm sair punished now for when she heard thomas at the door twa or three minutes syne she ordered me to let him in so that she could thank him for bringing the news last night despite the rain there in the parlour oh dominie gang him and stop his mouth this was hard i dared not go to the parlour margaret might have died at sight of me i turned my face from jean jean said someone opening the inner kitchen door why did you she stopped and that was what turned me round as she spoke i thought it was the young lady when i looked i saw it was babby though no longer in a gypsy's dress then i knew that the young lady and babby were one End of chapter thirty eight chapter thirty nine of the little minister this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the little minister by j m barry chapter thirty nine how babby spent the night of august fourth 
how had the egyptian been spirited here from the spittal i did not ask the question to interest myself in babbie at that dire hour of margaret's life would have been as impossible to me as to sit down to a book to others however it is only an old woman on whom the parlour door of the manse had closed only a garrulous domine that is in pain outside it your eyes are on the young wife when babbie was plucked off the hill she thought as little as gavin that her captor was rob dow close as he was to her he was but a shadow until she screamed the second time when he pressed her to the ground and tied his neckerchief over her mouth then in the moment that power of utterance was taken from her she saw the face that had startled her at nanny's window half carried she was borne forward rapidly until some one seemed to rise out of the broom and strike them both they had only run against the doctor's trap and huddling her into it dow jumped up beside her he tied her hands together with a cord for a time the horse feared the darkness in front more than the lash behind but when the rains became terrific it rushed ahead wildly probably with its eyes shut in three minutes babbie went through all the degrees of fear in the first she thought lord rintoul had kidnapped her but no sooner had her captor resolved himself into dow drunk with the events of the day and night than in the earl's hands would have lain safety next dow was forgotten in the dread of a sudden death which he must share and lastly the rain seemed to be driving all other horrors back that it might have her for its own her perils increased to the unbearable as quickly as an iron in the fire passes through the various stages between warmth and white heat then she had to do something and as she could not cry out she flung herself from the dog-cart she fell heavily in caddam wood but the rain would not let her lie there stunned it beat her back to consciousness and she sat up on her knees and listened breathlessly staring in the direction the trap had taken as if her eyes could help her ears all night i have said the rain poured but those charges only rode down the deluge at intervals as now and again one wave greater than the others stalks over the sea in the first lull it appeared to babbie that the storm had swept by leaving her to dow now she heard the rubbing of the branches and felt the torn leaves falling on her gown she rose to feel her way out of the wood with her bound hands then sank in terror for some one had called her name next moment she was up again for the voice was gavin's who was hurrying after her as he thought down windy ghoul he was no farther away than a whisper might have carried on a still night but she dared not pursue him for already dow was coming back she could not see him but she heard the horse whinny and the rocking of the dog-cart dow was now at the brute's head and probably it tried to bite him for he struck it crying would you stand still till i find her i heard her move this minute babbie crouched upon a big stone and sat motionless while he groped for her her breathing might have been tied now as well as her mouth she heard him feeling for her first with his feet and then with his hands and swearing when his head struck against a tree i kin your wit in heron he muttered and i hide you yet i have a gully knife in my hand listen he severed a windstalk with the knife and babbie seemed to see the gleam of the blade what do i mean by wantin to kill you he said as if she had asked the question do you know can wash said to me kill this woman it was the lord i winna kill her i said but i'll cart her out of the country kill her says he why encumbereth she the ground he resumed his search but with new tactics i see you now he would cry and rush forward perhaps within a yard of her then she must have screamed had she had the power but when he tied that neckerchief round her mouth he prolonged her life then came the second hurricane of rain so appalling that had babbie's hands been free she would have pressed them to her ears for a full minute she forgot thou's presence a living thing touched her face the horse had found her she recoiled from it but its frightened head pressed heavily on her shoulder she rose and tried to steal away but the brute followed and as the rain suddenly exhausted itself she heard the dragging of the dog-cart she had to halt again she heard dow's voice perhaps he had been speaking throughout the roar of the rain if so it must have made him deaf to his own words he groped for the horse's head and presently his hand touched babbie's dress then jumped from it so suddenly had he found her no sound escaped him and she was beginning to think it possible that he had mistaken her for a bush when his hand went over her face he was making sure of his discovery 
the lord has delivered you into my hands he said in a low voice with some awe in it then he pulled her to the ground and sitting down beside her rocked himself backward and forward his hands round his knees she would have parted the world for power to speak to him he wouldna hear am i just carting you to some other countryside he said confidentially the devil would just blah her back again says he therefore kill her and if i kill her i says they'll hang me you can hang yourself says he what wit i spears wi a reins at a dog cart says he they would break says i weel weel says he though they do hang you nobody'll miss you that's true says i and you are a just god he stood up and confronted her prisoner at the bar he said hae you only thing to say why sentence of death shouldn't be pronounced against you she does not answer she kens death is her deserts by this time he had forgotten probably why his victim was dumb prisoner at the bar hand back to me the soul of gavin dishart you winna did the devil your master summon you to him and say either that noble man or me maun leave thrums he did and did you or did you not drag that minister when under your spell to the hill and then marry him o'er the tongues you did witnesses rob thou and thomas woman she was moving from him on her knees meaning when out of arm's reach to make a dash for life sit down he grumbled or how can you expect a fair trial prisoner at the bar you have been found guilty of witchcraft for the first time his voice faltered that's the difficulty uh, for witches canna die except by burning or drowning there's no blood in you for my knife and your neck wouldna twist your master has brought the rain to put out o the fires and will hide to wait till it runs into a pool deep enough to drown you i wonder at you god you believe her master will make the pool for her he'll rather stop his rain mr dishart said you was mere powerful than the devil but it does not look like it if you had the power how did you no stop this woman working her will on the minister you can't what she was doing for you cannot things mr dishart says you can all things if you do the mare shame to you would a shepherd that could help it let dogs worry his sheep kill her it's fine to cry kill her but where's the bonfire where's the pool you that made the heaven and the earth and all that in them is can you no set fire to some wet winds or change this stein into a mill dam he struck the stone with his fist and then gave a cry of exultation he raised the great slab in his arms and flung it from him in that moment babby might have run away but she fainted almost simultaneously with dow she knew this was the stone which covered the caddam well when she came to dow was speaking and his voice had become solemn you said your master was mere powerful than mine and i said it too and all the time you were sitting here with the very pool and you that i had been praying for listen he dropped a stone into the well and she heard it strike the water what are you shaking at he said in reproof was it no your cell that chose the spot lassie say your prayers are you saying em he put his hand over her face to feel if her lips were moving and tore off the neckerchief and then again the rain came between them in that rain one could not think babby did not know that she had bitten through the string that tied her hands she planned no escape but she flung herself at the place where dow had been standing he was no longer there and she fell heavily and was on her feet again in an instant and running recklessly trees intercepted her and she thought they were dow and wrestled with them by and by she fell into windy ghoul and there she crouched until all her senses were restored to her when she remembered that she had been married lately how long dow was in discovering that she had escaped and whether he searched for her no one knows after time he jumped into the dog-cart again and drove aimlessly through the rain that wild journey probably lasted two hours and came to an abrupt end only when a tree fell upon the trap the horse galloped off but one of dow's legs was beneath the tree and there he had to lie helpless for though the leg was little injured he could not extricate himself a night and a day passed and he believed that he must die but even in this plight he did not forget the man he loved he found a piece of slate and in the darkness cut these words on it with his knife he being about to die 
I solemnly swear I did not see the minister marrying an Egyptian on the hill this night. May I burn in hell if this is no true. Shined Rob Dow. This document he put into his pocket, and so preserved proof of what he was perjuring himself to deny. End of chapter 39Chapter 40 of The Little Minister. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Little Minister by J. M. Barry. Chapter 40 Babby and Margaret. Defense of the Manse continued. The Egyptian was mournful in Windy Ghoul, up which she had once danced and sung but you must not think that she still feared Dow. I felt Mackenzie's clutch on my arm for hours after he left me, but she was far braver than I. Indeed, dangers at which I should have shut my eyes only made hers gleam, and I suppose it was sheer love of them that first made her play the coquette with Gavin. If she cried now, it was not for herself. It was because she thought she had destroyed him. Could I have gone to her then and said that Gavin wanted to blot out the gypsy wedding, that throbbing little breast would have frozen at once, and the drooping head would have been proud again, and she would have gone away forever without another tear. What do I say? I am doing a wrong to the love these two bore each other. Babby would not have taken so base a message from my lips. He would have had to say the words to her himself before she believed them his. What would he want her to do now, was the only question she asked herself. To follow him was useless, for in that rain and darkness two people might have searched for each other all night in a single field. That he would go to the spittle, thinking her in Rintoul's dog-cart, she did not doubt, and his distress was painful to her to think of. But not knowing that the burns were in flood, she underestimated his danger. Remembering that the mud-house was near, she groped her way to it, meaning to pass the night there, but at the gate she turned away hastily, hearing from the door the voice of a man she did not know to be Nanny's brother. She wandered recklessly a short distance until the rain began to threaten again, and then, falling on her knees in the broom, she prayed to God for guidance. When she rose, she set off for the manse. The rain that followed the flash of lightning had brought Margaret to the kitchen. Jean, did you ever hear such a rain? It is trying to break into the manse. I cannot hear you, ma'am. It is the rain you're feared at. What else could it be? Jean did not answer. I hope the minister won't leave the church, Jean, till this is over. "'Nobody would dar, ma'am. The rain'll turn the key on them all.' Jean forced out these words with difficulty, for she knew that the church had been empty and the door locked for over an hour. "'This rain has come as if in answer to a minister's prayer, Jean. "'It was no rain like this they wanted. "'Jean, you would not attempt to guide the Lord's hand. "'The minister will have to reprove the people for thinking too much of him again, "'for they will say that he induced God to send the rain.' "'Tonight's meeting will be remembered long in Thrums.' "'Jean shuddered and said, "'It's mere like an ordinary rain now, ma'am, "'but it has put out your fire and I want another heater. "'Perhaps the one I have is hot enough, though.' "'Margaret returned to the parlour, "'and from the kitchen Jean could hear the heater "'tilted backward and forward in the box-iron, "'a pleasant, homely sound when there is happiness in the house. "'Soon she heard a step outside, however, "'and it was followed by a rough shaking of the barred door.' "'Is it you, Mr. Dishart?' Jean asked nervously. "'It's me, Thomas Wallond. the presentor answered. "'Unbar the door.' "'What do you want? Speak low.' "'I winna speak low. Let me in. I hae news for the minister's mother.' "'What news?' demanded Jean. "'Jean Proctor, as chief elder of the Kirk, I order you to let me do my duty.' "'Where's the minister?' "'He's a minister no longer. He's married a gypsy woman and run awa with her.' you lie thomas woman i believe your beliefs of no consequence open the door and let me in to tell your mistress what i has seen she'll hear it first fry his eyne lips if she hears it ava i winna open the door then i'll burst it open woman flung himself at the door and jean her fingers rigid with fear stood waiting for its fall but the rain came to her rescue by lashing the presenter until even he was forced to run from it i'll be back again he cried woe to you jean proctor that i denied your god this night who was that speaking to you jean asked margaret re-entering the kitchen until the rain abated jean did not attempt to answer i thought it was the presentor's voice margaret said 
Jean was a poor hand at lying, and she stuttered in her answer. There's nothing wrong, is there? cried Margaret, in sudden fright. My son? No, nothing, nothing. The words jumped from Jean to save Margaret from falling. Now she could not take them back. I winna believe of him, said Jean to herself. Let them say what they will. I'll be true to him, and when he comes back he'll find her as he left her. It was Lang Thomas, she answered her mistress, but he just came to say that. Quick, Jean, what? Mr. Dishart had been called to a sick bed in the country, ma'am, to, to the farm I'll look about you, and as it's sit your in, he's to bide there and eat. And Wallen came through the rain to tell me this? How good of him. Was there any other message? Just that the minister hoped you would go straight to your bed, ma'am, said Jean, thinking to herself. There can be no great sin in giving her one mere happy knee. It may be her last. The two women talked for a short time, and then read verse about in the parlor from the third chapter of Mark. This is the first night we have been left alone in the manse, Margaret said, as she was retiring to her bedroom. And we must not grudge the minister to those who have sore need of him. I notice that you have barred the doors. Ay, they're barred. Nobody can win in the night. Nobody will want in, Jean, Margaret said, smiling. I dinna ken about that, answered Jean, below her breath. Hi, ma'am, may you sleep for baith of us this night, for I don't gang to my bed. Jean was both right and wrong, for two persons wanted in within the next half hour, and she opened the door to both of them. The first to come was Babby. So long as women sit up of nights listening for a footstep, will they flatten their faces at the window, the wall without be black. Jean had not been back in the kitchen for two minutes before she raised the blind. Her eyes were close to the glass when she saw another face almost meet hers, as you may touch your reflection in a mirror. But this face was not her own. It was white and sad. Jean suppressed a cry and let the blind fall as if shutting the lid on some uncanny thing. Won't you let me in? said a voice that might have been only the sob of a rain-beaten wind. I am nearly drowned. Jean stood like death, but her suppliant would not pass on. You are not afraid the voice continued raise the blind again and you will see that no one need fear me at this request jean's hands sought each other's company behind her back who are you she asked without stirring are you the woman yes horse the minister the rain again became wild but this time it only tore by the manse as if to a conflict beyond are you are there i durna let you in till i'm sure the mistress is bedded gang round to the front and see if there's only leak the burning in a high wish window there was a light, the voice said presently, but it was turned out as I looked. Then I'll let you in, and God kins I mean no rang by it. Babby entered shivering, and Jean rebarred the door. Then she looked long at the woman whom her master loved. Babby was on her knees at the hearth, holding out her hands to the dead fire. What a pity it's a false face. Do I look so false? Is it true? You're no married to him? Yes, it's true and yet you look as if you was fond of him if you cared for him how could you do it that was why i did it and him could i had wha he liked i gave up lord rintoul for him wha na na you're the egyptian you judge me by my dress and soaking it is how you're shirking what neat fingers what bonny little feet i could near believe what you tell me off with these rags and i'll guy you on my black frock if if you promise me no to gang away with it so babby put on some clothes of jeans including the black frock and stockings and shoes mr dishart cannot be back jean she said before morning and i don't want his mother to see me till he comes i would not let you near her the nicht though you guide on your knees to me for whar is he babby explained why gavin had set off for the spittle but jean shook her head incredulously saying i cannot believe that you are the grand lady and yet ilka time i look at you i could ne'er believe it in another minute jean had something else to think of for there came a loud rap upon the front door it's thomas Wamond back again she moaned and if the mistress hears she'll tell me to let him in you shall open to me cried a hoarse voice that's no thomas's word jean said in bewilderment it is lord rintoul babby whispered what then it's truth you telled me the knocking continued a door upstairs opened and margaret spoke over the banisters have you gone to bed jean some one is knocking at the door and a minute ago i thought i heard a carriage stop close by perhaps the farmer has driven mr dishart home i'm putting on my things ma'am jean answered then whispered to babby what's to be done he won't go away babby answered you'll have to let him into the parlor jean 
Can she see the door from up there? No, but though he was in the parlor, I shall go to him there. Make haste, Jean, Margaret called. If it is any persons wanting shelter, we must give it to them on such a night. A minute, ma'am, Jean answered. To Babbie, she whispered, What shall I say to her? I, uh, I don't know, answered Babbie ruefully. Think of something, Jean, but open the door now. Uh, stop, let me into the parlor first. The two women stole into the parlor. Tell me what will be the result of his coming here, entreated Jean. The result, Babbie said firmly, will be that he shall go away and leave me here. Margaret had heard Jean open the front door and speak to some person or persons whom she showed into the parlor. End of chapter 40「forty one of the little minister this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the little minister by j n barry chapter forty one rintoul and babby breakdown of the defence of the manse you dare look me in the face they were rintoul's words yet babby had only ventured to look up because he was so long in speaking his voice was low but harsh like a wheel on which the brake is pressed sharply it seems to be more than the man is capable of he added sourly do you think babby exclaimed taking fire that he is afraid of you so it seems but i will drag him into the light wherever he is skulking lord rintoul strode to the door and the brake was off his tongue already go said babby coldly and shout and stamp through the house. You may succeed in frightening the women who are the only persons in it. Where is he? He has gone to the spittle to see you. He knew I was on the hill. He lost me in the darkness, and thought you had run away with me in your trap. Ha! So he is off to the spittle to ask me to give you back to him. To compel you, corrected Babby. Pooh, said the earl nervously. That was but mummery on the hill. It was a marriage with gypsies for witnesses their word would count for less than nothing babby i am still in time to save you i don't want to be saved the marriage had witnesses no court could discredit what witnesses mr mackenzie and yourself she heard his teeth meet when next she looked at him there were tears in his eyes as well as in her own it was perhaps the first time these two had ever been in close sympathy both were grieving for Rintoul. I am so sorry, Babby began in a broken voice, and then stopped, because they seemed such feeble words. If you are sorry, the earl answered eagerly, it is not yet too late. Mackenzie and I saw nothing. Come away with me, Babby, if only in pity for yourself. Oh, but I don't pity myself. Because this man has blinded you. No, he has made me see this mummery on the hill why do you call it so i believe god approved of that marriage as he could never have countenanced yours and mine god i never heard that word on your lips before i know that it is his teaching doubtless yes and he told you that to do to me as you have done was to be pleasing in god's sight no he knows that it was so evil in god's sight that i shall suffer for it always but he has done no wrong, so there is no punishment for him. It is true that he has done no wrong, but his punishment will be worse, probably, than mine. That, said the earl, scoffing, is not just. It is just. He has accepted responsibility for my sins by marrying me. And what form is his punishment to take? For marrying me, he will be driven from his church and dishonored in all men's eyes, unless unless god is more merciful to us than we can expect her sincerity was so obvious that the earl could no longer meet it with sarcasm it is you i pity now he said looking wonderingly at her do you not see that this man has deceived you where was his boasted purity in meeting you by stealth as he must have been doing in plotting to take you from me if you knew him babby answered you would not need to be told that he is incapable of that he thought me an ordinary gypsy until an hour ago and you had so little regard for me that you waited until the eve of what was to be our marriage and then laughing at my shame ran off to marry him 
i am not so bad as that babbie answered and told him what had brought her to thrums i had no thought but of returning to you nor he of keeping me from you we had said good-bye at the mud-house door and then we heard your voice and my voice was so horrible to you that it drove you to this i i love him so much what more could babbie answer these words told him that if love commands home the friendships of a lifetime kindnesses incalculable are at once as naught nothing is so cruel as love if a rival challenges it to combat why could you not love me babbie said the earl sadly i have done so much for you it was little he had done for her that was not selfish men are deceived curiously in such matters when they add a new wing to their house they do not call the action virtue but if they give to a fellow-creature for their own gratification they demand of god a good mark for it babbie however was in no mood to make light of the earl's gifts and at his question she shook her head sorrowfully is it because i am too old this was the only time he ever spoke of his age to her oh no it is not that she replied hastily i love mr dishart because he loves me i think have i not loved you always never babbie answered simply if you had perhaps then i should have loved you babbie he exclaimed if ever a man loved a woman and showed it by the sacrifices he made for her i no babbie said you don't understand what it is oh i did not mean to hurt you if i don't know what it is what is it he asked almost humbly i scarcely know you now that is it said babbie she gave him back his ring and then he broke down pitifully doubtless there was good in him but i saw him only once and with nothing to contrast against it i may not now attempt to breathe life into the dust of his senile passion these were the last words that passed between him and babbie there was nothing he said wistfully in this wide world that you could not have had by asking me for it was not that love no she answered what right have i to everything i cry for you should never have had a care had you married me that is love it is not i want to share my husband's cares as i expect him to share mine i would have humoured you in everything you always did as if a woman's mind were for laughing at like a baby's passions you had your passions too babbie yet did i ever chide you for them that was love no it was contempt oh she cried passionately what have not you men to answer for who talk of love to a woman when her face is all you know of her and her passions her aspirations are for kissing to sleep her very soul a plaything i tell you lord rintoul it is all the message i send back to the gentleman at the spittal who made love to me behind your back that this is a poor folly and well calculated to rouse the wrath of god now jean's ear had been to the parlour keyhole for a time but some message she had to take to margaret and what she risked saying was this it's lord rintoul and a party that has been catched in the rain and he would be obliged to you if you could guy his bread shelter for the nicht thus the distracted servant thought to keep margaret's mind at rest until gavin came back lord rintoul exclaimed margaret what a pity gavin has missed him of course she can stay here did you say i had gone to bed i should not know what to say to a lord but ask her to come up to me after he is gone and jean is the parlour looking tidy lord rintoul having departed jean told babbie how she had accounted to margaret for his visit and she tilled me to guy you dry close and her compliments and would you gang up to the bedroom and see her very slowly babbie climbed the stairs i suppose she is the only person who was ever afraid of margaret her first knock on the bedroom door was so soft that margaret who was sitting up in bed did not hear it when babbie entered the room margaret's first thought was that there could be no other so beautiful as this and her second was that the stranger seemed even more timid than herself after a few minutes talk she laid aside her primness a weapon she had drawn in self-defence lest this fine lady should not understand the grandeur of a man's and at a call me babby won't you she smiled that is what another person calls you said margaret archly do you know that he took twenty minutes to say good-night my dear 
she added hastily, misinterpreting Babby's silence. I should have been sorry had he taken one second less. Every tick of the clock is a gossip, telling me how he loves you. In the dim light, a face that begged for pity was turned to Margaret. He does love you, Babby, she asked, suddenly doubtful. Babby turned away her face and then shook her head. But do you love him? Again, Babby shook her head. Oh, my dear, cried Margaret in distress. If this is so, are you not afraid to marry him? She knew now that Babby was crying, but she did not know why Babby could not look her in the face. There may be times, Babby said, most woeful that she had not married Rintoul, when it is best to marry a man though we do not love him. You are wrong, Babby, Margaret answered gravely. If I know anything at all, it is that. It may be best for others. Do you mean for one other? Margaret asked, and the girl bowed her head. Ah, oh, Babby, you speak like a child. You do not understand. I do not need to be told the circumstances to know this, that if two people love each other, neither has any right to give the other up. Babby turned impulsively to cast herself on the mercy of Gavin's mother, but no word could she say. A hot tear fell from her eyes upon the coverlet, and then she looked at the door, as if to run away. But I have been too inquisitive, Margaret began, whereupon Babby cried, Oh, no, 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 you are very good. I have no one who cares whether I do right or wrong. Your parents? I have had none since I was a child. It is the more reason why I should be your friend, Margaret said, taking the girl's hand. You do not know what you are saying. You cannot be my friend. Yes, dear, I love you already. You have a good face, Babby, as well as a beautiful one. Babby could remain in the room no longer. She bade Margaret good night and bent forward to kiss her, then drew back like a Judas ashamed. Why did you not kiss me? Margaret asked in surprise. But poor Babby walked out of the room without answering. Of what occurred at the manse on the following day until I reached it, I need tell little more. When Babby was tending Samuel for Corson's child in the tenements, she learned of the flood in Glen Quharity and that the greater part of the congregation had set off to the assistance of the farmers. But fearful as this made her for Gavin's safety, she kept the new anxiety from his mother. Deceived by another story of Jean's, Margaret was the one happy person in the house. "'I believe you had only a lover's quarrel with Lord Rintoul last night,' she said to Babby in the afternoon. "'Ah, you see, I can guess what has taken you to the window so often. You must not think him long in coming for you.' I can assure you that the rain which keeps my son from me must be sufficiently severe to separate even true lovers. Take an old woman's example, Babby. If I thought the minister's absence alarming, I should be in anguish. But as it is, my mind is so much at ease that, see, I can thread my needle. It was in less than an hour after Margaret spoke thus tranquilly to Babby that the presenter got into the manse. End of chapter 41。Chapter 42 of the Little Minister. Margaret, the Presenter, and God Between. Unless Andrew Luke, who went to Canada, be still above ground, I am now the only survivor of the few to whom Lang Thomas told what passed in the manse parlour after the door closed on him and Margaret. With the years the others lost the details, but before I forget them, the man who has been struck by lightning will look at his arm without remembering what shrivelled it. There even came a time when the scene seemed more vivid to me than to the presentor, though that was only after he began to break up. She was never the kind of woman, Laman said, that a body need be nine feared at. You can see she is the timid sort. I could not have selected a woman easier to speak bold out to, though I had I might pick of them. He was a gaunt man, sour and hard, and he often paused in his story with a puzzled look on his forbidding face. But, man, she was so meek they windy of him. If he had wanted to put a knife into her, I believe that woman would just I tell him to take care and no to cut his hands. I and what innocent like she was. If she had heard enough afore I saw her to make her uneasy, I could I begun at once. 
but here she was shaking my hand and smiling to me so that i when i tried to speak i guide through either nobody can despise me for it i tell you mair than i despise myself i thought to myself let her hide her smile out thomas womond it's her hindmost sign with shame at my cowardliness i tried to yoke to my duty as chief elder to kirk and i said to her as thrawn as i could speak dinna thank me i've done nothing for you i ken it wasna for me who did it she said but for him but oh mr Wyman, will that make me think the less of you he's my all she says with that smile back in her face and a look mixed up with it that said as plain and i need no more i thought o saying that some builds their house upon the sand but that gun it dominie it's a solemn thing the pride mithers has in their laddies i mind it's my ain mother what the devil are you glowering at andrew luke do you think i'm greeting you'll sit down mr Wyman, she says next no i winna i said angry like i dinna come here to sit i could see she thought i was shy at being in a man's parlour ay and i thought she was pleased at me looking shy well she took my hat out of my hand and she put it on the chair at the door where there's i and all chair in grand houses for the servant to sit on at family exercise you're a man mr Wyman, says she that the minister delights to honour and so you'll oblige me by sitting in his own armchair gavin never quite delighted to honour the presenter of whom he was always a little afraid and perhaps margaret knew it but you must not think less of her for wanting to gratify her son's chief elder she thought too that he had just done her a service i never yet knew a good woman who did not enjoy flattering men she liked i saw my chance at that womond went on and i says to her sternly in worldly position i says i'm a common man and it's no for the like as it's to sit in a minister's chair but it has been god's will i says to wrap around me the mantle o chief elder o' the kirk and if the minister falls awa frae grace it becomes my duty to take his place if she had been looking at me she maun hae grown feared at that and syne i could hae gone on though my ilka word was a knock-down blow but she was picking some things off the chair to let me down on't it's a pair of mittens i'm working for the minister she says and she handed them to me ay i tried not to take them but oh lads it's queer to think how saft i was he's no to ken about them till they're finished she says terrible fond like the words came to my mouth they'll never be finished and i could ha cursed myself for no saying em i didna ken how it was but there was something pitiful in seeing her take up the mittens and begin working cheerily at one and me kenning all the time that they would never be finished i washed her fingers and i said to myself another stitch and that mon be your last i said that to myself till i thought it was the needle that said it and i wondered at her no hearing in the tail of the day i says you need not bother you'll never wear them and they sounded sich words of doom that i rose up off the chair ay but she took me a rhyme and she said i see you've noticed how careless i his own comforts he is and that in his zeal he forgets to put on his mittens though they may be in his pocket a' the time oh she says confident like but he winna forget these mittens mr Wyman, and i tell you the reason it's because they're his mother's work i stamped my foot and she gied me an apologetic look and she says i cannot help boasting about his being so fond of me my but here was me saying to myself do your duty thomas womond you slugger do your duty and without lifting my ain friar fingers i said sternly the chances are i said that these mittens will never be worn by the hands they are worked for you mean she says that he'll guide them awa to some ill off body as he guides near a thing he has ay but there's one thing he never parts with and that's my work there's a young lady the monster now says she they offered to finish the mittens for me but he would value them less if i let ony other body put a stitch into them i thought to myself thomas woman the lord has opened the door for you and you'll be disgraced for ever if you dinna walk straight in so i rose again and i says boldly this time where's that young lady i hae something to say to her that canna be kept waiting she's up the stair she says surprised but you cannot ken her mr Wyman, for she just came last night i ken mair o' her than you think says i i ken what brocked her here and ken wha she thinks she is to be married to and i've come to tell her that she'll never get him 
how no she said amazed like because said i with my teeth to get her he is already married lads i stood waiting to see her fall and when she didna fall i just waited longer thinking she was slow and taking it in i see you can wa she is she said looking at me and yet i canna credit your news they're true i cries even if they are says she considering it may be the best thing that could happen to baith of them i sank back in a chair in fair bewilderment for i didna ken at that time as we a ken now that she was thinking of the earl when i was thinking of her son dominie it looked to me as if the lord had opened the door to me and sign shut it in my face shine with me shittin there in a kind of awe at a woman's simpleness she began to tell me what the minister was like when he was a bairn and i was saying a that time to myself your chief elder at a kirk thomas woman and you maun speak out the next time she stops to draw breath they were terrible small common things she tells me she just near a mither's mind about their parents but the kind of holy way she said them drove my words down my throat like as if i was some infidel man trying to break out with blasphemy in a kirk i'll let you see something says she that i can will interest you she brocked it out of a drawer and who do you think it was i sure as death it was no more than some of his hair when he's a litin and it was tied up such carefully in paper that you oh, i thought it was some valuable thing mr Ormond, says she solemnly you have come thrice to the manse to keep me fight being uneasy about my son's absence and you was the chief instrument under god in bringing him to thrums and i'll guy you a little o that hair the bonnet what did i care about his hair and yet to see her fondling it i says to myself mrs dishart i says to myself i was the chief instrument under god in bringing him to thrums and i've come here to tell you that i'm to be the chief instrument under god in driving him out o't ay but when i fuck to bring out these words my mouth snapped like a box dinna guy me his hair was all i could say and i would not take it fry her but she laid it in my hand and and sign what could i do oh it's easy to speak about thy things now and to wonder how i could i so disgrace the position of chief elder at a kirk but i tell you i was near greeting for a woman call me names dominie i deserve them all i did not call woman names for being reluctant to break margaret's heart here is a confession i may make sometimes i say my prayers at night in a hurry going on my knees indeed but with as little reverence as i take a drink of water before jumping into bed and for the same reason because it is my nightly habit i am only pattering words i have by heart to a chair then and should be as well employed writing a comic bible at such times i pray for the earthly well-being of the presenter though he has been dead for many years he crept into my prayers the day he told me this story and was part of them for so long that when they are only a recitation he is part of them still she said to me the woman continued that the women of the congregation would be fond to handle the hair could i tell her that the women was war agin him than the men i shivered to hear her sign when they're a sitting breathless listening to his preaching she says they'll be able to picture him as a bear just as i often do in the kirk myself and you look you're sneering at me but i tell you if you had been there and had begun to say he'll preach in our kirk no more i would a struck you and i'm chief elder of the kirk she says oh mr Wyman, there's times in the kirk when he is praying and the glow on his face is hardly mortal so that i fall a-shaken with a mixture of fear and pride me being his mother and sinful though i am to say it i cannot help thinking at such times that i ken what the mother of jesus had in her heart when she found him in the temple dominie it's sax and twenty years since i was made an elder to kirk i mind the day as if it was yestreen mr carfrae made me walk home with him and he took me into the manse parlour and he set me in that very chair it was the first time i was ever in the manse ay he little thought that day in his earnestness and i little thought to myself in the pride of my lusty youth that the time was coming when i would swear in that reverenced parlour i say swear dominie for when she had finished i jumped to my feet and i cried hell and i lifted up my hat and i was chief elder she fell back fry my oath he said and sign she took my sleeve and speared what has come over you mr wamond are you anything on your mind i've sin on it i roared at her 
i have neglected duty on it i am one of them that cries lord lord and yet do not the things which he commands he has pointed out the way to me and i hinna followed it what is it you hinna done that you should i done she said oh mr woman if you want my help it's yours your son's out of earth to you i cried but my eldership says muckle to me sacks in twenty years i had been an elder and now i mun gie it up who says that she spears i say it i cried i've shirked my duty i gie up my eldership now thomas wamond is no longer an elder to kirk i and i was chief elder Domini, i think she began to say that when the minister came hanna he wouldna accept my resignation but i paid no heed to her you ken what was the sound that kicked my ears frae her words it was the sound o a machine come and yont the tenements you ken what was the sicht that made me glare through the window instead of looking at her it was the sicht of mr dishart in the machine i could not speak but i got my body atween her and the window for i heard shouting and i couldna doubt that it was the folk cursing him but she heard too she heard too and she squeezed by me to the window and i could not look out i just walked saft like to the parlor door but afore i reached it she cried joyously he's my son come back and see how fond of him they are they are running at the side of the machine and the laddies are tossing their bonnets in the air god help ya woman i said to myself it cannot be bonnets it's the steins and divots mere likely that they're flinging at him syne i creeped out of the manse dominie you mind i passed you in the kitchen and didna say a word yes i saw the presenter pass through the kitchen with such a face on him as no man ever saw him wear again since thomas woman died we have had to enlarge the thrums cemetery twice so it can matter not at all to him but little to me and what you who read think of him all his life children ran from him he was the dourest the most unlovable man in thrums but may my right hand wither and may my tongue be cancer bitten and may my mind be gone into a dry rot before i forget what he did for me and mine that day End of chapter forty two Chapter forty three of the Little Minister. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Little Minister by J. M. Barry. Chapter forty three. Rain, Mist, the Jaws. To this day, we argue in the Glen about the sound mistaken by many of us for the firing of the Spittle Cannon some calling it thunder and others the tearing of trees in the torrent i think it must have been the roll of stones into the coharity from silver hill of which a corner has been missing since that day silver hill is all stones as if creation had been riddled there and in the sun the mic on them shines like many pools of water at the roar as they thought of the cannon the farmers looked up from the struggle with the flood to say that's rintoul's married as clocks pause simultaneously to strike the hour then every one in the glen save gavin and myself was done with rintoul before the hills had answered the noise gavin was on his way to the spittle the dog must have been ten minutes in overtaking him yet he maintained afterward that it was with him from the start from this we see that the shock he had got carried him some distance before he knew that he had left the schoolhouse it also gave him a new strength that happily lasted longer than his days of mind gavin moved northward quicker than i came south climbing over or wading through his obstacles while i went round mine after a time too the dog proved useful for on discovering that it was going homeward it took the lead and several times drew him to the right road to the spittle by refusing to accompany him on the wrong road yet in two hours he had walked perhaps nine miles without being four miles nearer the spittle in that flood the glen milestones were three miles apart for some time he had been following the dog doubtfully for it seemed to be going too near the river when they struck a cart track however he concluded rightly that they were nearing a bridge his faith in his guide was again tested before they had been many minutes on this sloppy road the dog stopped whined looked irresolute and then ran to the right disappearing into the mist in an instant he shouted to it to come back 
and was surprised to hear a whistle in reply. This was sufficient to make him dash after the dog, and in less than a minute he stopped abruptly by the side of a shepherd. "'Have you barked it?' the man cried almost into Gavin's ear. Yet the roar of the water was so tremendous that the words came faintly as if from a distance. "'Why is me? Is it only you, Mr. Dishart? Is it only you?' No one in the glen would have addressed a minister thus except in a matter of life or death, and Gavin knew it. "'He'll be o'er late,' the shepherd exclaimed, rubbing his hands together in distress. "'I'm speaking o' Windbus's grieve. He has run for ropes, but he'll be o'er late.' "'Is there someone in danger?' asked Gavin, who stood, he knew not where, with this man, enveloped in mist. "'Is there no? Look! There is nothing to be seen but mist. Where are we? We're on the high bank of the Coharty. Take care, man, you was stepping o'er into the roaring water. Lie down and tell me if he's there yet. Maybe I just think that I see him, for the seat is painted on my ain. Gavin lay prone and peered to the river, but the mist came up to his eyes. He only knew that the river was below from the sound. Is there a man down there? he asked, shuddering. There was a minute sign on a bit island. Why does he not speak? He is senseless. Dinna move, the mist's clearing, and you'll see if he's thar sign. The mist has been lifting and fallen that way ilka minute since me and the grieve saw him. The mist did not rise. It only shook like a blanket, and then again remained stationary. But in that movement, Gavin had seen twice, first incredulously, and then with conviction. Shepherd, he said, rising, it is Lord Rintoul. Aye, oh, it's him, and ye saw his feet was in the water. They were dry when the grieve left me. Mr. Dishart, the ground he is on is being washed awa bit by bit. I tell ye, the flood's greedy for him, and it'll hide him. Look, did you see him again? Is he living? We saw him move. Hist! Was that a cry? It was only the howling of the dog, which had recognized its master and was peering over the bank, the body quivering to jump, but the legs restless with indecision. If we were down there, Gavin said, we could hold him secure till rescue comes. It is no great jump. How far would you make it? I saw him again. It looked further that time. That's it. Sometimes the ground he is on looks so near that you think you could almost drop on it, and the next time it's yards and yards away. I've stood ready for the spring, Mr. Dishart, a dozen times, but I, I sickened. I darna do it. Look at the dog. Just when it's starting to jump, it pulls its sail back. As if it had heard the shepherd, the dog jumped at that instant. It sprang too far, Gavin said. It didn't spring far enough. They waited, and presently the mist thinned for a moment, as if it was being drawn out. They saw the earl, but there was no dog. Poor brute, said the shepherd, and looked with awe at Gavin. Rintoul is slipping into the water, Gavin answered. You won't jump? No, I'm why for him, and then I will, Gavin was about to say. But the shepherd continued, and him only married twa hours syne. That kept the words in Gavin's mouth for half a minute, and then he spoke them. Dinna think o' it, cried the shepherd, taking him by the coat. The ground he is on is slippery. I flung a dozen stains at it, and them that hit it slithered off. Though you landed in the middle o't, you would slide into the water. He shook himself free o' me, the shepherd told afterwards, and I saw him bend them down and measuring the distance with his een as cool as if he was calculating a drill of tatties. Sign I saw his lips move in prayer. It wasna spunk he needed to pray for, though. Next minute there was me in my very arms prigging with him to think better o't, and him standing ready to loop, his knees bent, and not a tremble in them. The mist lifted, and I... Lads, I couldna gie a look at the earl. Mr. Dishart jumped. I hardly saw him, but I can't, I can't, I was on the bank alone. What did I do? I flung myself down in a sweat, and if he could bore mist, mine would I done it. I thought I heard the minister's death cry, and may I be struck if I dinna believe now that it was a scarl o' my ain. After that there was no sound but the jaw o' the water, and I prayed, but no to God, to the mist to rise, and after an awful time it rose, and I saw the minister was safe. He had pulled the earl into the middle of the bit island and was rubbing him back to consciousness. I sweat when I think of it yet. The little minister's jump is always spoken of as a brave act in the glen, but at such times I am silent. This is not because, being timid myself, I am without admiration for courage. My little maid says that three in every four of my poems are to the praise of prowess, and she has not forgotten how I carried her on my shoulder once to Tilliedrum to see the soldier who had won the Victoria Cross and made her shake hands with him, though he was very drunk. 
only last year one of my scholars declared to me that nelson never said england expects every man this day to do his duty for which i thrashed the boy and sent him to the cooling stone but was it brave of gavin to jump i have heard some maintain that only misery made him so bold and others that he jumped because it seemed a fine thing to risk his life for an enemy but these are really charges of cowardice and my boy was never a coward of the two kinds of courage however he did not then show the nobler i am glad that he was ready for such an act but he should have remembered margaret and babbie as it was he may be said to have forced them to jump with him not to attempt a gallant deed for which one has the impulse may be braver than the doing of it though it seemed as lang time the shepherd says as i could hae run up a hill in i dinna suppose it was many minutes afore i saw rintoul opening and shutting his een the next glint i had at him they were speaking to ane another ay and mair than speaking they were quarrelling i couldna hear their words but there was a moment when i thought they were to grapple lads the memory o that'll hing about my death-bed there was twa men edicated to the highest pitch ane a lord and utter a minister and the flood was taken awa the mouthful o their foot in ilka minute and the jaws o destruction was gaping for them and yet they were near fechting we ken now it was about a woman ay but does that make it less awful no that did not make it less awful it was even awful that gavin's first words when rintoul opened his eyes and closed them hastily were where is she the earl did not answer indeed for a moment the words had no meaning to him how did i come here he asked feebly you should know better than i where is my wife i remember now rintoul repeated several times yes i had left the spittle to look for you you were so long in coming how did i find you it was i who found you gavin answered you must have been swept away by the flood and you too in a few words gavin told how he came to be beside the earl i suppose they will say you have saved my life was rintoul's commentary it is not saved yet if help does not come we shall be dead men in an hour what have you done with my wife rintoul ceased to listen to him and shouted sums of money to the shepherd who shook his head and bawled an answer that neither gavin nor the earl heard across that thundering water only gavin's voice could carry the most powerful ever heard in the thrums pulpit the one voice that could be heard all over the comanti during the time of the tent preaching yet he never roared as some preachers do of whom we say ah if they could hear the little minister's word gavin caught the gesticulating earl by the sleeve and said another man has gone for ropes now listen to me how dared you go through a marriage ceremony with her knowing her already to be my wife rintoul did listen this time how do you know i married her he asked sharply i heard the cannon now the earl understood and the shadow on his face shook and lifted and his teeth gleamed his triumph might be short-lived but he would enjoy it while he could well he answered picking the pebbles for his sling with care you must know that i could not have married her against her will the frolic on the hill amused her but she feared you might think it serious and so pressed me to proceed with her marriage to-day despite the flood this was the point at which the shepherd saw the minister raise his fist it fell however without striking do you really think that i could doubt her gavin said compassionately and for the second time in twenty-four hours the earl learned that he did not know what love is for a full minute they had forgotten where they were now again the water seemed to break loose so that both remembered their danger simultaneously and looked up the mist parted for long enough to show them that where had only been the shepherd was now a crowd of men with here and there a woman before the mist came again between the minister had recognized many members of his congregation in his unsuccessful attempt to reach wind buses the grieve had met the relief party from thrums already the weavers had helped waster lunny to stave off ruin and they were now on their way to the wind buses keeping together through fear of mist and water every few minutes snecky hobart rang his bell to bring in stragglers follow me was all the panting grieve could say at first but his agitation told half his story they went with him patiently only stopping once and then excitedly for they came suddenly on rob dow rob was still lying a prisoner beneath the tree and the grieve now remembered that he had fallen over the tree and neither noticed the man under it nor been noticed by the man fifty hands released poor dow and two men were commissioned to bring him along slowly while the others hurried to the rescue of the earl they were amazed to learn from the shepherd that mr dishart also was in danger and after is there a woman wi him some cried he'll get off cheap wi drowning and it's the judgment o god 
the island on which the two men stood was now little bigger than the round tables common in thrums and its centre was some feet further back from the bank than when gavin jumped a woman looking down at it sickened and would have toppled into the water had not john spence clutched her others were so stricken with awe that they forgot they had hands peter tosh the elder cast a rope many times but it would not carry the one end was then weighted with a heavy stone and the other tied round the waists of two men but the force of the river had been underestimated the stone fell short into the torrent which rushed off with it so furiously that the men were flung upon their faces and trailed to the verge of the precipice a score of persons sprang to their rescue and the rope snapped there was only one other rope and its fate was not dissimilar this time the stone fell into the water beyond the island and immediately rushed downstream gavin seized the rope but it pressed against his body and would have pushed him off his feet had not tosh cut it the trunk of the tree that had fallen on rob dow was next dragged to the bank and an endeavour made to form a sloping bridge of it the island however was now soft and unstable and though the trunk was successfully lowered it only knocked lumps off the island and finally it had to be let go as the weavers could not pull it back it splashed into the water and was at once whirled out of sight some of the party on the bank began hastily to improvise a rope of cravats and the tags of the rope still left but the mast stood helpless and hopeless you may wonder that we could have stood still waiting to see the last of them burst the post has said to me in the schoolhouse but dominy i couldna hae moved magra my neck i'm a hale man but if this minute we was to hear the voice of the almighty saying solemnly afore the clock strikes again burst the post will fall down dead of heart disease what do you think you would do i'll tell you you would stand where you are and stare tongue-tied at me till i dropped how do i ken by the teaching of that nicht ay but there's a mere important thing i dinna ken and that is whether i would be palsied with fear like the earl or face death with the calmness of the minister indeed the contrast between rintoul and gavin was now impressive when tosh had signed that the weavers had done their all and failed the two men looked in each other's faces and gavin's face was firm and the earl's working convulsively the people had given up attempting to communicate with gavin save by signs for though they heard his sonorous voice when he pitched it at them they saw that he caught few words of theirs he heard our skirls burst said but couldna grip the words only mair than we could hear the earl and yet we screamed and the minister didna i've heard the highlandmen with the same gift so that they could be heard across a glen we must prepare for death gavin said solemnly to the earl and it is for your own sake that i again ask you to tell me the truth worldly matters are nothing to either of us now but i implore you not to carry a lie into your maker's presence i will not give up hope was all rintoul's answer and he again tried to pierce the mist with offers of reward after that he became doggedly silent fixing his eyes on the ground at his feet i have a notion that he had made up his mind to confess the truth about babby when the water had eaten the island as far as the point at which he was now looking End of chapter 43chapter forty four of the little minister this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the little minister by j m barry chapter forty four end of the twenty four hours out of the mist came the voice of gavin clear and strong if you hear me hold up your hands as a sign they heard and none wondered at his voice crossing the chasm while theirs could not when the mist cleared they were seen to have done as he bade them many hands remained up for a time because the people did not remember to bring them down so great was the awe that had fallen on all as if the lord was near gavin took his watch from his pocket and he said i am to fling this to you you will give it to mr ogilvy the schoolmaster as a token of the love i bear him the watch was caught by james langlands and handed to peter tosh the chief elder present to mr ogilvy gavin continued you will also give the chain you will take it off my neck when you find the body to each of my elders and to hendry munn kirk officer and to my servant jean i leave a book and they will go into my study and choose it for themselves i also leave a book for nanny webster 
and I charge you, Peter Tosh, to take it to her, though she be not a member of my church. The pictorial Bible with To my son on his sixth birthday on it I bequeath to Rob Dow. No, m my mother will want to keep that. I give to Rob Dow my Bible with the brass clasp. It is my wish that every family in the congregation should have some little thing to remember me by. This you will tell my mother. To my successor, I leave whatsoever of my papers he may think of any value to him, including all my notes on Revelation, of which I meant to make a book. I hope he will never sing the paraphrases. If Mr. Carfrae's health permits, you will ask him to preach the funeral sermon. But if he be too frail, then you will ask Mr. Trail, under whom I sat at Glasgow. The illustrated Pilgrim's Progress on the drawers in my bedroom belongs to Mr. Trail, and you will return it to him with my affection and compliments. I owe five shillings to Henry Munn for mending my boots, and a smaller sum to Baxter, the mason. I have two pounds belonging to Rob Dow, who asked me to take charge of them for him. I owe no other man anything, and this you will bear in mind if Matthew Cargill, the flying stationer, again brings forward a claim for the price of Whiston's Josephus, which I did not buy from him. Mr. Moncur of Aberbrothick had agreed to assist me at the sacrament, and will doubtless still lend his services. Mr. Carfrey or Mr. Trail will take my place if my successor is not elected by that time. The sacrament cups are in the vestry press, of which you will find the key beneath the clock in my parlor. The tokens are in the topmost drawer in my bedroom. The weekly prayer meeting will be held as usual on Thursday at eight o'clock, and the elders will officiate. It is my wish that the news of my death be broken to my mother by Mr. Ogilvy, the schoolmaster, and by no other. You will say to him that this is my solemn request, and that I bid him discharge it without faltering, and be of good cheer. But if Mr. Ogilvy be not now alive, the news of my death will be broken to my mother by my beloved wife. Last night I was married on the hill, over the tongs, but with the sanction of God to her whom you call the Egyptian. And despite what has happened since then, of which you will soon have knowledge, I here solemnly declare that she is my wife, and you will seek for her at the spittle or elsewhere till you find her, and you will tell her to go to my mother and remain with her always, for these are the commands of her husband. It was then that Gavin paused, for Lord Rintoul had that to say to him which no longer could be kept back. All the women were crying sore, and also some men whose eyes had been dry at the confining of their children. Now I can, said Crookshanks, who had been an atheist, that it's only the fool who says in his heart there is no God. Another said, that's a man. Another said, that man has a religion to last him all through. And a fourth said, behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. A fifth said, That's our minister. He's the minister of the Isle Lickirk Thrums. Woe is me were to lose him. Many cried, Our hearts were set hard against him, O Lord. Are you angry with your servants that you're taking him fry us just when we ken what he is? Gavin did not hear them, and again he spoke. My brethren, God is good. I have just learned that my wife is with my dear mother at the manse. I leave them in your care and in his. No more, he said of Babby, for the island was become very small. The Lord calls me hence. It is only for a little time I have been with you, and now I am going away, and you will know me no more. Too great has been my pride because I was your minister. But he who sent me to labor among you is slow to wrath, and he ever bore in mind that you were my first charge, my people, I must say to you, farewell. Then, for the first time, his voice faltered, and wanting to go on, he could not. Let us read, he said quickly, in the word of God in the fourteenth of Matthew, from the twenty-eighth verse. He repeated these four verses. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. 
and when peter was come down out of the ship he walked on the water to go to jesus but when he saw the wind boisterous he was afraid and beginning to sink he cried saying lord save me and immediately jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him o thou of little faith wherefore didst thou doubt after this gavin's voice was again steady and he said the sand glass is almost run out dearly beloved with what words shall i bid you good-bye many thought that these were to be the words for the mist parted and they saw the island tremble and half of it sink my people said the voice behind the mist this is the text i leave with you lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal that text i read in the flood where the hand of god has written it all the pound notes in the world would not damn this torrent for a moment so that we might pass over to you safely yet it is but a trickle of water soon to be dried up verily i say unto you only a few hours ago the treasures of earth stood between you and this earl and what are they now compared to this trickle of water god only can turn rivers into wilderness and the water springs into dry ground let his word be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path may he be your refuge and your strength amen this amen he said quickly thinking death was now come he was seen to raise his hands but whether to heaven or involuntarily to protect his face as he fell none was sure for the mist again filled the chasm then came a clap of stillness no one breathed but the two men were not yet gone and gavin spoke once more let us sing in the twenty-third psalm he himself raised the tune and so long as they heard his voice they sang the lord's my shepherd i'll not want he makes me to lie in pastures green he leadeth me the quiet waters by my soul he doth restore again and me to walk doth make within the paths of righteousness even for his own name's sake yea though i walk in death's dark vale yet will i fear none ill for thou art with me and thy rod and staff but some had lost power to sing in the first verse, and other at death's dark veil, and when one man found himself singing alone, he stopped abruptly. This was because they no longer heard the minister. "'O oh Lord!' Peter Tosh cried. "'Lift the mist, for it's mare than we can bear!' The mist rose slowly, and those who had courage to look saw Gavin praying with the earl. Many could not look, and some of them did not even see Rob Dow jump, for it was Dow the man with the crushed leg who saved gavin's life and flung away his own for it suddenly he was seen on the edge of the bank holding one end of the improvised rope in his hands and tosh says what all happened in the opening and shutting of an eye and it's a queer thing to say but though i prayed to god to take awa the mist when he did raise it i couldn't look i shut my een tight and held my arm afore my face like i'm feared of being struck even when i dared to look my arm was shaken so that I could see Rob both above it and below it. He was on the edge, crouching to leap. I didna see who had hard at the other end of the rope. I heard the minister cry, No, Dow, no! And it guide through me as quick as a stab that if Rob jumped he would knock them both into the water. But he did jump, and you ken how it was that he did not knock them off. It was because he had no thought of saving his own life he jumped not at the island now little bigger than the seat of a chair but at the edge of it into the foam and with his arm outstretched for a second the hand holding the rope was on the dot of land gavin tried to seize the hand rintoul clutched the rope the earl and the minister were dragged together into safety and both left the water senseless gavin was never again able to lift his left hand higher than his head dow's body was found next day near the schoolhouse End of chapter 44
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Little Minister by J. M. Barry. Chapter 45. Talk of a Little Maid Since Grown Tall. My scholars have a game they call The Little Minister, in which the boys allow the girls as a treat to join. Some of the characters in the real drama are omitted as of no importance. The Dominie, for instance, and the two best fighters insist on being Dow and Gavin. I notice that the game is finished when Dow dies from a haystack, and Gavin and the Earl are dragged to the top of it by a rope. Though there should be another scene, it is only a marriage, which the girls have therefore to go through without the help of the boys. This warns me that I have come to an end of my story, for all except my little maid. In the days when she sat on my knee and listened, it had no end. For after I told her how her father and mother were married a second time, she would say, And then I came, didn't I? Oh, tell me about me. So it happened that when she was no higher than my staff, she knew more than I could write in another book, and many a time she solemnly told me what I had told her, as, Would you like me to tell you a story? Well, it's about a minister, and the people wanted to be bad to him, and then there was a flood, and a flood is locks falling instead of rain, and so, of course, he was nearly drowned, and he preached to them till they liked him again, so they let him marry her, and they like her awful, too, and just think— it was my father, and th that's all. Now, tell me about grandmother when father came home. I told her once again that Margaret never knew how nearly Gavin was driven from his girt, for Margaret was as one who goes to bed in the daytime and wakes in it and is not told that there has been a black night while she slept. She had seen her son leave the manse, the idol of his people, and she saw them rejoicing as they brought him back. Of what occurred at the jaws as the spot where Dow had saved two lives is now called, she learned, but not that these jaws snatched him and her from an ignominy more terrible than death, for she never knew that the people had meditated driving him from his kirk. This thrums is bleak and perhaps forbidding, but there is a moment of the day when a setting sun dyes it pink, and the people are like their town. Thrums was never colder in times of snow than were his congregation to their minister when the great rain began but his fortitude rekindled their hearts. He was an obstinate minister, and love had led him a dance, but in the hour of trial he proved himself a man. When Gavin reached the manse and saw not only his mother but Babby, he would have kissed them both, but Babby could only say, She does not know, and then run away crying. Gavin put his arm round his mother and drew her into the parlor, where he told her who Babby was. Now, Margaret had begun to love Babby already, and had prayed to see Gavin happily married, but it was a long time before she went upstairs to look for his wife and kiss her and bring her down. Why was it a long time? my little maid would ask, and I had to tell her to wait until she was old and had a son when she would find out for herself. While Gavin and the Earl were among the waters, two men were on their way to Mr. Carfrae's home to ask him to return with them and preach the Eildlick Kirk of Thrums Vacant and he came, though now so done, that he had to be wheeled about in a little coach. He came in sorrow, yet resolved to perform what was asked of him if it seemed God's will. But instead of banishing Gavin, all he had to do was to remarry him and kirk him, both of which things he did, sitting in his coach, as many can tell. Lang Tammas spoke no more against Gavin, but he would not go to the marriage, and he insisted on resigning his eldership for a year and a day, I think he only once again spoke to Margaret. She was in the manse garden when he was passing, and she asked him if he would tell her now why he had been so agitated when he visited her on the day of the flood. He answered gruffly, It's no business of yours. Dr. McQueen was Gavin's best man. He died long ago of scarlet fever. So severe was the epidemic that for a week he was never in bed. He attended fifty cases without suffering, but as soon as he had bent over Henry Munn's youngest boys, who both had it, he said, I'm smitted, and went home to die. You may be sure that Gavin proved a good friend to Micah Dow. I have the piece of slate on which Rob proved himself a good friend to Gavin. It was in his pocket when we found the body. 
Lord Rintoul returned to his English estates and never revisited the Spittal. The last thing I heard of him was that he had been offered the Lord Lieutenantship of a county, and had accepted it in a long letter, in which he began by pointing out his unworthiness. This undid him, for the Queen, or her counsellors, thinking from his first page that he had declined the honour, read no further and appointed another man. Waster Lunny is still alive, but has gone to another farm. Sanders Webster, in his gratitude, wanted Nanny to become an Auld Licht, but she refused, saying, Mr. Dishart is worth a dozen of Mr. Duthy, and I'm terrible fond of Mrs. Dishart, but established I was born, and established I'll remain till I'm carried out of this house feet foremost. But Nanny went to heaven for all that, my little maid told me. Jean says people can go to heaven, though they are not Auld Licht, but she says it takes them all their time. Would you like me to tell you a story about my mother putting glass on the manse dyke? Well, my mother and my father is very fond of each other, and once they was in the garden, and my father kissed my mother, and there was a woman watching them over the dyke, and she cried out, something naughty. It was to be burse, I said, and what she cried was, mercy on us, that's the third time in half an hour. So your mother, who heard her, was annoyed and put glass on the wall. But it's me that's telling you the story. You are sure you don't know it? Well, they asked Father to take the glass away, and he wouldn't. But he once preached at Mother for having a white feather in a bonnet, and another time he preached at her for being too fond of him. Jean told me. That's all. No one seeing Babby going to church demurely on Gavin's arm could guess her history. Sometimes I wonder whether the desire to be a gypsy again ever comes over her for a mad hour, and whether, if so, Gavin takes such measures to cure her as he threatened in Caddam Wood. I suppose not. But here is another story. When I asked Mother to tell me about her once being a gypsy, she says I am a bad quizzeth little girl, and to put on my hat and come with her to prayer meeting. And when I asked Father to let me see Mother's gypsy frock, he made me learn some forty-eight by heart. But once I seed it, and it was a long time ago, as long as a week ago, Micah Dow gave me Rowan's to put in my hair, and I like Micah because he calls me Miss. And so I woke in my bed because there was noises, and I ran down to the parlor, and there was my mother in her gypsy frock, and my Rowan's was in her hair, and my father was kissing her, and when they saw me they jumped and that's all. Would you like me to tell you another story? It is about a little girl. Well, there was once a minister and his wife, and they hadn't no little girls, but just little boys. And God was sorry for them, so he put a little girl in a cabbage in the garden. And when they found her, they were glad. Would you like me to tell you who the little girl was? Well, it was me and Ugh. As awful cold in the cabbage. Do you like that story? Yes, I like it best of all the stories I know. So do I like it too. Couldn't nobody help loving me because I'm so nice. Why am I so fearful nice? Because you are like your grandmother. It was clever of my father to know when he found me in the cabbage that my name was Margaret. Are you sorry grandmother is dead? I'm glad your mother and father were so good to her and made her happy. Are you happy? Yes, but when I am happy, I laugh. I am old, you see, and you are young. I'm nearly six. Did you love grandmother? Then why did you never come to see her? Did grandmother know you was here? Why not? Why didn't I not know about you till after grandmother died? I'll tell you when you are big. Shall I be big enough when I'm six? No. Not till your eighteenth birthday. But birthdays come slow. Would it come quicker when I am big? Much quicker. On her sixth birthday, Micah Dow drove my little maid to the schoolhouse in the doctor's gig, and she crept beneath the table and whispered, Grandfather, father told me to call you that if I like, and I like, she said when I had taken her upon my knee. I know why you kissed me just now. It was because I looked like grandmother. You kiss me when I look like her. Who told you I did that? Nobody didn't tell me. I just found out. I loved Grandmother, too. She told me all the stories she knew. Did she ever tell you a story about a black dog? No. Did she know one? 
Yes, she knew it. Perhaps she had forgotten it. No, she remembered it. T tell it to me. Not till you are eighteen. W will you not be dead when I am eighteen? When you go to heaven, will you see grandmother? Yes. Will she be glad to see you? My little maid's eighteenth birthday has come, and I am still in Thrums, which I love, though it is beautiful to none, perhaps save to the very done, who lean on their staves and look long at it, having nothing else to do till they die. I have lived to rejoice in the happiness of Gavin and Babbie, and if at times I have suddenly had to turn away my head after looking upon them in their home, surrounded by their children, it was but a moment's envy that I could not help. Margaret never knew of the dominie in the glen. They wanted to tell her of me, but I would not have it. She has been long gone from this world, but sweet memories of her still grow, like honeysuckle, up the white walls of the manse, smiling in at the parlour window and beckoning from the door, and for some filling all the air with fragrance. It was not she who raised the barrier between her and me, but God himself, and to those who maintain otherwise I say they do not understand the purity of a woman's soul. During the years she was lost to me, her face ever came between me and ungenerous thoughts, and now I can say all that is carnal in me is my own, and all that is good I got from her. Only one bitterness remains. When I found Gavin in the rain, when I was fighting my way through the flood, when I saw how the hearts of the people were turned against him, above all when I found Wamond in the manse, I cried to God, making promises to him, if he would spare the lad for Margaret's sake, and he spared him. But these promises I have not kept. End of the Little Minister <laughs>